Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Candice and I'm an event manager at Town Hall. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle and our partner bookseller Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with Sebastian Younger and Matt Gallagher as part of our arts and culture series. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Haitian Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Sebastian and Matt for appearing tonight to help make that possible. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us tonight by making a donation or becoming a member. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include our Earshot Jazz concert series, uh, continues this weekend with Mariana Albero, the Mariana Albero Trio, presenting some stunning jazz, piano, and hammer, hammer dulcimer performances. Uh, next week, our partners at Seattle City Club continue their civic cocktail series with local journalists, trying to assess how the guilty verdict in the George Floyd murder trial has impacted local and national progress towards racial, racial justice. And Audrey Lim confronts us with the most mostly forgotten American communities where the brutal realities of industrial pollution and environmental degradation have been playing out for uh, climate justice. You can check out more of what's upcoming by visiting our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Tonight's presentation is going to be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video player, so you can submit those at any time. You can also text questions to 206-504-2857, as noted in the chat. We can't guarantee that we'll get to every question, but we'll get to as many as we can. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, you can click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player, and the program will be available for re-watching immediately following the event. Uh, Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our arts, arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, the Northcliffe Foundation, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. And Town Hall is also a member-supported organization, so I want to thank all the members watching tonight. And finally, if you want to dive deeper into tonight's conversation by purchasing a copy of the book being presented, you'll want to use the link in the chat below to purchase through our partner bookseller, Third Place Books. And now for tonight's event. Sebastian Younger is New York Times bestselling author of books. Uh, this list is going to range from 1997 through uh, 2017. The Perfect Storm, Fire, A Death in Belmont, War, and Tribe. As an award-winning journalist and contributing editor to Vanity Fair and a special correspondent at ABC News, he's covered major international news stories around the world and has received both a National Magazine Award and a Peabody Award. Younger is also a documentary filmmaker whose debut film, Restrepo, co-directed with Tim Hetherington, was nominated for an Academy Award and won Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. 
He's also the founding director of Vets Town Halls, where veterans of, of any war and any amount of service are invited to speak about their experience serving in the US military and listening to other accounts. Matt Gallagher is a Wake Forest graduate and US Army veteran. He's the author of uh, the novel Young Blood, a finalist for the 2016 Dayton Literary Peace Prize, as well as 2020's Empire City. He also has a memoir titled Kaboom, Embracing the Suck in a Savage Little War, which was published in 2010. Gallagher holds an MFA in fiction from Columbia and has written for the New York Times, Esquire, and the Paris Review. He currently works as a writing instructor for New York University's English department's Words After War, a workshop devoted to bringing veterans and civilians together to study conflict literature. Younger's new book, Freedom, is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Matt Gallagher and Sebastian Younger. Sebastian, great to see you, uh, and congratulations on, uh, on Freedom. It's, it's just a superb book. Thank you so much. I've, I've, I love hearing that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to be, be in conversation with you this evening. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to start, uh, and you know, this, this book, uh, it's, it's such a powerful powerful read, you know, it, it, about 150 pages, but there's, there's so much going in, going on in, 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 on, on every page. Uh, what, what was kind of the seed for this? What was the genesis? Uh, right. and, and, and then how did it develop into, into the book we, we have, we, we have today? Yeah. Well, well thank you. Um, it, uh, the, the genesis really was a couple of years ago, I started thinking to myself, my, you know, my previous book was tr called Tribe, and it was about community. And um, of course, community, the, 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 the tribe, the, the family, is something that people all over the world, societies all over the world, will die to defend. I mean, I mean, without hesitation. And it occurred to me that freedom is also this other sort of enduring core human value that people will risk their lives, will die to defend. And, um, and how would I, but how would I write about it? And I, I and I, I started really thinking about what, <clears throat> what allows humans to be self-defining in the, in the, in the face of a, of a greater power, which is basically the, 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 the meaning of the word freedom. I mean, freedom is a moot point if there is no greater power trying to uh, control your actions. And, but how do humans maintain their autonomy? When a, when a greater power, and there's always a bigger tribe, a bigger country, a bigger empire, or just a bigger person uh, that can dominate us. And so how do we maintain our autonomy? And, you know, I came up with having done, did a lot, I did a lot of research, these basic like three categories, you can outrun your oppressor. And if you can't outrun him, you can outfight him. And if you can't outfight him, you're going to have to outthink him. And so my book is divided in, into run, fight and think. And while I was sort of chewing on all of this, I asked myself, like, what's the freest that I've ever been? You know, of course, it depends how you define it. But um, I, I, my mind went back to this extraordinary trek that I undertook a few years ago with a couple of uh, American veterans from Af that I knew out in Afghanistan and a, a Spanish war photographer, a Spanish photographer named Guillermo Cervera, who was in the back of a rebel pickup truck with my buddy Tim, as Tim bled out from a shrapnel wound in, in Libya, outside um, the city of Misrata in Libya in 2011. And I got to know Guillermo very well. And I, I, so I got these guys together. I said, look, I want to I want to walk along the railroad lines from Washington, D.C. To, to New York. And um, I picked the railroad lines because they're, they're these weird sort of swaths of no man's land. And uh, there aren't any cops out there unless they're looking for you, which they were looking for us at times, even once in a helicopter, actually. Um, it's just sort of this wild territory and it's and it goes right through society. It's not the Appalachian Trail. You know, you're going through ghettos and factories and farms and, and wilderness and rich, you know, wealthy suburbs. You're going through everything right through the middle. And there's a lot because it's sort of like it's private, you know, it's uh, private. Um, it, it's owned by the railroad company, so it's not developed. And so you can sleep under bridges and abandoned buildings. And I just had this idea of this sort of wild, weird trip through America. And, and uh, in, 
in thinking about it, I thought, you know, for 400 miles, like we were the only people who knew where we were at night. And um, that's a form of freedom. And it was hard won. We were carrying 60, 70 pounds. And, you know, it was a very, very tough trip. And I thought that, no, that's a form of freedom that I would be interested in talking about. You know, I, and I kept notebooks the whole time just because I wasn't going to, I didn't do the trip thinking I'd write about it. I just wanted to take this trip. And, and, uh, but I kept my notebooks. And so I, I dug those out of a closet and started going through them. And, and so the narrative of that trip, we, we hit Philadelphia and turned, instead of going to New York, we turned West and headed for Pittsburgh. Um, and the, so the narrative of, that, of, narrative of that trip is interwoven through the research that I did. Interesting. Okay. I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of walking through the multitudes of America, right? And like freedoms, you know, it's about a, a group of men and a dog on the road. It's, it's a, you know, it's kind of, uh, at parts you, you kind of tra- trace the, the history, historiography of, of the philosophical idea. Uh, but it's, but it is, it's all, you're, you're tracing kind of how our country came to be. I mean, there's this really wonderful line uh, about a, a, a third of the way into the book. Uh, America could seem like that a country moving so fast and with so much weight that only a head on collision with itself could make it stop. Uh, it, it feels very much, uh, you know, that's a, a, an observation of the geography uh, that, that you're experiencing, but it, but it, you know, it, it, it has a lot more philosophical connotations as well, given, given the last few years that our, our country has been through was, was that, was that something that just kind of came to be as you were writing this, uh, uh, trying, trying to see, try, trying to trace what, you know, whatever this, this big, massive nation that we all call home is? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's impossible. I mean, it's a, uh, America is a behemoth, you know, and when you're on foot in, in, the, in the land of the behemoth, you know, you're like, you're, 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 you're free because you're almost unnoticeable. You know, we're moving three miles an hour and everything else is going 100. And, uh, you know, we felt, because we were so slow and so tiny and we could, and could hide so easily uh, and were willing to live so rough, you know, we didn't, didn't even have tents and, and uh, we had a tarp in case it rained, but that was it. We weren't armed. We'd, all we had was machete. Uh, and, uh, and, and it just, it, I, it occurred to me, wow, we're, kind of, we're you know, we're, we're, we're free because we're so tiny and powerless. That's what gives us our freedom. This nation isn't even noticing us. And then of course, you know, I had the next thought was, well, except that we, we depend on this nation for the backpacks we have, for the food we're eating, you know, for the knife in my pocket, you know, like, and so I just had this sort of insight, like, you can, you can do this sort of performance art of independence. And, you know, that might be, you know, walking along railroad lines, or the performance art might be going down to the city hall with a machine gun, you know what I mean? Like, all of it's a sort of like, uh, a, a performance, a display of autonomy. But in fact, you know, the Michigan militia or wherever those guys were that showed up uh, at the state house in Michigan protesting the masking laws, you know, those guys are completely indep- are completely dependent on society, right? I mean, they, you know, the, the, the guns they carry, the gasoline they put into their trucks to drive where they were going, the trucks they drove in, the, the, the cheeseburger they had at lunch, you know, like, and it just, you know, it just occurred to me like, oh, my God, like w- there is no escaping our dependence on the society. But that's been true for a hundred thousand years. Like this is just a new version of it. But the idea, it does put the lie to this sort of American fable of the sort of rugged individual who needs nothing and nobody. It's complete nonsense. Uh, and I, let me just say that that sentence, which I was proud of when I wrote it, you know, like, but it came out of a question that I had and an answer that was given to me. So we were, you know, we were sleeping in the underbrush somewhere in Pennsylvania. I can't remember where. And, and um, we cooked dinner along the Juniata River. We cooked dinner and it was, you know, nighttime and the trains were pumping by, you know, all the freights run at night and, and, uh, um, and really shake the world when they go by you. And, uh, and I said, they, they're so heavy. They're going so fast. They're a mile long and they're cruising at six, 70 miles an hour. They're a mile long. They weigh 20,000 tons or something. I can't remember. And I just said to the guys, I was like, what do you think it would take to stop one of those in its tracks? Like instantly. And I was picturing just some massive wall that would sort of pile up against. 
And Brendan, actually, one of the other guys, he said, oh, that's easy. All we'd have to do is hit the exact same train going in the opposite direction, and they'd both stop, they'd both stop in, in, instantly. And that was to me, that was so brilliant and so obvious. And then later, as I was writing the book, I just thought, oh, my God, that's America. Like, nothing can stop this thing um, except itself. And that may be the only thing that can bring this, this amazing country to a stop. It, it, it struck me as very, you know, both very insightful and also very prescient because, you know, you, uh, this trip was a, was a couple years ago. Uh, you know, you, you wrote that sentence uh, it, it, at least, you know, let's say if, a few months ago, uh, probably about a year, a year ago or so. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I came upon that sentence. It made me think of January 6th uh, yeah. at the U.S. Capitol, you know, watch, watching a country literally colliding with itself. Uh, so, um, you know. Maybe not something you want to be uh, uh, correct about, but uh, uh, still, still very, uh, very insightful there. Uh, it, you mentioned that um, kind of the, you know, being out there on the road and, and uh, this weird dichotomy and friction between uh, freedom and community. And you, you, you talk uh, at, at different points in the book about you know the difference between freedom and exile, right? And, and freedom being when you're part of a group. And that uh, you know, choice choices connect to that. Uh, and you, uh, I, I, you, you introduce us to folks like the the Black motor, Motorcycle Gang of, of Outlaws, right? That that uh, help you all get water uh, at one point, but make it very clear that you need to get back on the road uh, uh, as soon as you do. And then you you you, uh, you encounter a number of of different 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 people on uh, uh, on the railroads who who are exiles uh, who have clearly departed society. Um, for reasons, you know, for, for reasons that um, uh, they're not they're not going to share with you. What what did you learn about maybe the the differences between between those two ideas uh, out there on the trail? Well, I you know I mean I'll definitely say that had I been, had I been out there by myself, it would have felt scary and furtive and um, wouldn't have felt like freedom. Being scared is not a form of freedom. You know, being scared, being in danger, that's not freedom. Uh, Having not having a lot, uh, not not having a lot of possessions, having few, so few possessions that you can carry them, that you can carry everything you need. Arguably, that is a form of freedom, as as is having you know enough money to 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 satisfy your survival requirements. That's also a form of freedom. Uh, possessions can be a form of freedom, and so you know, it just it it comes down to a you know a, a kind of philosophical debate that I actually didn't go into, but you know, but ultimately. There's this sort of Zen proposition that the belong your 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 own belongings and your habits and your obsessions um, are the things that change that change and chain you and and to be really free you have to be free of all attachment right and um, that's a really really interesting point and I there's a guy who's not in my book um, I kind of veered away from the philosophy because I felt like I was out of my depth. And that there's so many brilliant people have written about the philosophical aspect of freedom that I was like, I'm not going to wade into those waters. You know, I'm going to drown. But, but um, I had something different to offer. But at any rate, I, you know, I interviewed a guy who'd done some decades in prison for committing a very, very bad, bad crime. And he paid his debt to society and he, you know, came from a brutal background and he educated himself and he found religion, he found enlightenment and amazing, amazing person. And I, I interviewed him, he just gotten out of prison. And I said, um, I said, I, I, I said, this maybe is a kind of naive question, but I, I, it's an honest question. Like, is it possible, possible to be more free in prison than out of prison? And he looked at me like, yeah, of course it is. Are you kidding? And um, he said, there are no drugs in prison. So for starters, you're not going to be an addict. Of course, addiction is, a is, is the opposite of freedom. And, uh, and he said, you, you know, there's really, there's no money in prison, really. Like, you, you know, like you, you, all you got is time. And there's no distractions. There's no iPhones. There's no drama. There's no whatever. Like you, you're, you say, all you got is time. And eventually, eventually you were going to have an honest conversation with yourself about who you really are. And when you finally do that, it may take you 10 years. But there's no distractions, nothing to keep you from finally having that conversation. And when you finally have it, you will be a free person. And a lot, there's a lot of people on the outside, meaning, you know, not in prison, 
uh, who are just so distracted, they're never going to get around to doing that, and they are not free people. And that was such a profound insight. And um, it had also, it sort of made me think, uh, Mike Tyson said, you know, obviously he's enormously wealthy from his bo incredible boxing career, or maybe he blew it all, I, I don't know. But anyway, at one point he was very wealthy. But he said, he said, the, the, uh, the freest I've ever been was when I had nothing. And, you know, it, it's a... Um, it's easy for me to say I make a good living and I have the material things that I need around me. And it's easy for me to romanticize having nothing. But the, but the fact is that there were people that we met out there who had nothing. And the answer of, you know, whether they're free or not is a little more complicated, like the guy in prison, it's a little more complicated than you might think. And you can make a pretty good case that the more you own, the more you have, the less free you are. That, that, that's not that hard a case to make. Yeah, it, it seems um, there's this constant tension, right, between between freedom and security. And, and, and I think or, 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 uh, yep. and you, you describe it in your book as a continuum, right, um, try, trying to find that balance. And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I, I think the book without I don't want to give too much away to, to viewers who haven't read the book yet. But, um, uh, you know, ultimately, they're they're in the last the last scene. You make a choice, right, to to return back to society, to return back to to back to civilization, um, are you are you asserting uh, is, is that choice itself a, a form of freedom? Do you think as, as you're as you're out there in the river? Yeah, I mean, let me say that the 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 the, the trek that we did, we called it high speed vagrancy. You know, we were moving like 10, 15, 20 miles a day. Uh, most days were pretty miserable, just because it's hard to do that with the amount of weight we were carrying. Um, so this was not um, a pleasure. This was not. This was not a vacation, right? It was the opposite of vacation, right? Uh, but it was a kind of solution to, to another problem, which was because of the combat we'd been in, because of the weird place the country was at, because of where we were in our lives, all of us were experiencing a state of sort of psychic dislocation, I would say. And the patrol, we called it the last patrol. Um, the last patrol was a kind of solution to that. It, I wouldn't call it therapy, but it just was such a weird, raw, different thing to do that it it it, it functions. It had some function that was what was healthy for us. But the but here's the thing about solutions. Solutions you have to watch out because if, it, eventually solutions can become uh, the problem. Solutions, the, the, the solutions to an addiction that you have can become its own addiction. And I, you know, I sort of real, you know, there are guys that keep going back to war, right? Journalists and soldiers. It's a solution to a problem they're having at home, but, but then eventually that solution becomes the main problem in their life. And I realized that there was a point with, with the last patrol, I was like, wow, we're about to hit the Ohio river. Like there's another 2,500 miles to go. Like there's that, like, and, you know, I started thinking that and I, I was like, the, all right, what are you doing out here exactly? And, and you know, one of the most important things, I think, for to maintain one's freedom and one's and a good life is to recognize endpoints when they appear. And if you don't recognize endpoints and if you just keep going and that's true of marriage, friendships, um, work war, drinking, you know, whatever. It's true of everything, right? If you don't recognize the natural endpoint of something, you you will probably not be free of its influence. I mean, you you will be um, uh, subjugated subjugated to it. Were you were you at points before that uh, the intellectual part of your brain kicked in? Was there a point where you're like, to hell with it, let's hit the Ohio and just just keep going because <laughs> I, we've, we're escaping it all. I still harbor secret, secret hopes. Of God. I mean, the last time I was out there, uh, it was only a couple of years ago. And, you know, I have two young children. The youngest is a year and a half. And uh, so now there are some realities in my life that I, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less quote free, but I'm in much, much freer in other ways. You know, my book is dedicated to my family because they sort of introduced to me the most profound form of freedom that I know. Um, which is being having the just unbelievable experience of love in a healthy family. I mean, 
everything else pales in comparison to that. And who knew? I'd never experienced it before. You know, and so so at any rate, I uh, I hope to go back there because I love it out on the tracks. I really, really love it. And um, but uh, and I was out there a couple of years ago out by Connellsville along the Okagani River. And uh, you know, I was telling you before we started, like one of the guys got pretty sick drinking that water and uh, was sick for about a week. So, uh, you know, it has its downside, it has its costs, but I think me and particularly this one other guy, Brendan O'Byrne, I think we would want to keep going out there for many, many years. I'm almost 60. Like I got to do it now. Like, I don't know when the knees are going to give out. I keep looking down at them. Like, you guys, okay. You guys still okay. And it's still stuff I want to do, you know, and they seem to be okay. So I'll keep going. Sure. Sure. No, I, you know, it, it, uh, there's this line, uh, it seemed like a long, hard, weird thing to do until you were actually out there when suddenly it, it was so obvious. And I mean, that, that reminded me, that reminded me a lot of work. Uh, oh, totally. so the yeah. parallels are, are absolutely there. And it's, it sounds like that's something you and Brendan and the, and the others probably talked about while, while you were out there. Yeah. I mean, war is totally insane until you're in the middle of it. And then it makes unbelievable sense, right? Like it's, it's and what looks insane is life back home? Are you like, are you kidding? Like that's, that's life. Like, and it's such a weird, I mean, obviously humans, you know, we're an amazing species. We're very adaptive to our, our, uh, we adapt very easily to our circumstances. We adapt almost immediately. Like you, within a few days in a war, you're like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I mean, war is normal. And it only takes a few days, right? It takes a few hours on the railroad, li railroad lines for that to feel normal. Like it takes nothing couple of freights go by, you know, we, the engineers will call you in. So you had to get very tuned, tuned up out there to your environment because there were times like around curbs where a freight, tr a freight train or a passenger train, the passenger trains would go 140. I mean, they really flew. Those things would be on you so fast and the engineers will call the cops and then the cops come and then you really have a problem, right? Cause you have to hide from the cops. And that's not a great thing to do. So the, um, we got really tuned in to feeling the trains. And I don't know, I really honestly don't know what we were feeling. Like you can hear them and you can see them, but there were times when I, we would just look at each other like, are you are you feeling it? I'm like, yeah, it's something's coming. And we get into the woods and sure enough, a freight would blow, blow by. I, I mean, just in physical terms, I don't know what we were picking up. It wasn't auditory, you know, it wasn't, I don't know what it was, but we, could ju we just got tuned up out there. And that was such a cool feeling. It's like, we are so plugged into our environment nothing can sneak up on us even something going 140 yeah that's uh yeah there's something in, yeah environmental that that is that is like when you when you're um uh abroad in a war zone and and you're good at what you're doing you 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 have you have those those men and women who who tap into that sixth sense just like that yeah yeah and then we would you know we had to devise i sound like such a miscreant i mean i should make i should just like set the record straight here Technically, it's illegal to walk along the railroad lines, and and officially, I have to tell everybody: do not do it. Right? It's not not a good thing to do. Um, but um, what we, we felt about it was that it's illegal because it's private property, but it wasn't immoral. There were no you know victims to our our transgression, and so it was sort of on us. That said. I do feel a little bad about the times that our presence triggered some, you know, some police searches for, cause they didn't know we weren't bad guys. Right. And I mean, they were doing their jobs and, you know, we just didn't want to get taken in. So um, the uh, we had to devise these sort of strategies for dealing with that reality. And so, we, you know, at the one point uh, uh, cops were looking for us in patrol cars and I was like, listen, we, you know, we hid in the woods and I was like, we got to move. I, you know, we're losing all this mileage today. Like what? And so we just, what we realized is everything out of the railroad lines has to have a headlight on. Right. So I'd like, listen, we'll just walk at night and we'll definitely see everything coming a mile out. Like, I mean, you can't sneak up on us with a headlight. And uh, so we would, we would walk at night if we thought people were looking for us. And then the other thing we would do during the day is, you know, there's four or five guys. And if each person turns around on a sort of, you know, random schedule and looks behind them. And if all four or five guys are doing that, nobody's sneaking up on you from behind. And you just have to like have everyone do it randomly. And you have this sort of constant rearward surveillance that's, you know, very hard for, for, to, to defeat. And so we developed these techniques just um, like I'm sure you guys did in Afghanistan for sort of like, 
being, um, you know, being sort of in, in control of your environment, basically. Yeah, it's uh, the individual is, is beholden to the group, and but you're all uh, you're all acting, and, and you do such a really good job of, of detailing uh, uh, those individual responsibilities, right? And, and it, it was there was no que- there was no question about it. Uh, 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 it was because what benefited the group benefited the individual, and, and in that way, it kind of really reminded me of um, uh, some of Orwell's best work in, in Down and Out in Paris and London when he's kind of uh, uh, wandering the English countryside. I, I mean, was that consciously kind of a, a spiritual ancestor for this book? Um, or, uh, is, is, that, is, that, is that a book that, that um, uh, you, you've, you've admired in the past? Or, or were, there, were there other books that you were looking to as, as you were kind of putting this together? No, I mean, now that's going on my list. I never read that. I, I read Amor de Catalonia. Um, my dad grew up in Spain, and, and I'm very fond of Spain. I actually just wrote it a piece in Time Magazine about the rise of fascism in Spain in the 1930s, forced my father's family to leave. Um, but uh, no, I haven't, I haven't read that, uh, that book, and I will. I, I'm, I don't know if there really was a direct inspiration. No, there wasn't. Although I would say that I've, you know, my, the way that I write, my writing style, um, inevitably, I never studied English in college or anything, but inevitably it's a, a byproduct, a product of, um, the books that I've read by the amazing authors that, you know, I love. And, you know, you could probably pick out, you know, you can probably pick out Hemingway in there. Joan Didion's another favorite. Um, Cormac McCarthy. You know I mean? I'm sure you, <laughs> I'm sure it would be embarrassingly easy to fish out the influences and say, oh, yeah, he's been reading Cormac. There, look. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're the great, you know, they're greats and they're greats for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the one of the uh, many great lines in the book, and, and I think one of the, the central ideas that you end up exploring throughout is um, it's very early on. Uh, you're you're out, out there uh, set up for the night. And you said most nights we were the only people in the world who knew where we were. There are many def- definitions of freedom, but surely that is one of them. Uh, beautiful line, beautiful image. What what were some other definitions that that you think? this experience, this experience, either, either walking, walking the lines or, or just your research for the book in general taught you? Yeah. I mean, so there's this basic human paradox, which is you are definitely, you and your people are definitely not free if there's a neighboring enemy group that would like to kill you or enslave you. And if you can't defend yourself against that adversary, you are not free and, um, or you won't be free for long. And so for tens of thousands of years, human freedom has been sort of synonymous with safety. If you're not safe, if your lives are in danger, you're not free. Like if someone can come in and, and kill all of you or enslave you, you're not free. And so, so the ability to, the, I mean, for a very long time in human history, the, 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 the most warlike people were the freest because no one could mess with them. And um, you know, a, a one extreme example, is, is a group called the Yamnaya. Uh, they were from the Eastern steppe, from the Russian steppe about 5,000 years ago. And they would do these raids. Um, all, they, they would leave the women behind. They would uh, just groups of men on horse-drawn chariots, like swinging battle axes, like, like carved their way through Europe and invaded Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula 5,000 years ago. And within about a hundred years, they wiped out all of the men in Iberia like all the men and, you know, and took the women basically. And um, we know this because of the DNA that remains in the Iberian Peninsula today. And uh, so, so the, you know, the Iberian men were just scrubbed from the gene pool, the ult- ultimate loss of freedom because they couldn't defend themselves against the Yamnaya. They were like, you know, the first motorcycle gang and they couldn't, they couldn't be stopped. And, and uh, so what was I saying in the book? If you're well organized enough and 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 sort of fierce enough and well armed enough to defend your freedom against an outside enemy, which is the, the first definition of freedom, basically. If you're well organized and well armed enough to do that, a a leader, a ruler, a ruling elite is perfectly positioned to then turn around and deprive everyone else in the society of their freedom to oppress their own people. And of course, Western society, European society. Uh, has a long and ghastly history of the ruling elite um, 
you know, these are countries, these are societies that were very good at fighting. Uh, the ruling elite basically running this like labor camp of serfs, you know, for centuries and centuries. And uh, so the other, you know, the other uh, challenge for human freedom is that you have a fair and equitable society, uh, even though you're also militaristic enough to defend yourselves. And that balance is extremely tricky. And hunter gatherers, you know, that lived in, that live in small scale, organic societies of 40, 50 people are very, very good at defending themselves and making sure that leadership does not get abusive. Uh, they're very egalitarian societies. Uh, the Apache are a great example, a very mobile Stone Age society back, you know, you know, hundreds of years ago, um, where there wasn't a lot of social stratification. Uh, no one could catch them. They just moved too fast. And, uh, uh, and then the, the, other, the, uh, the other end of history the other kind of society that's very good at balancing defense with justice are democracies, Western style democracies, any, any kind of democracy. Um, but obviously uh, leaders are always in a position of abusing their position of power and, um, and, and taking over in undemocratic ways. That's constantly, that's constantly a danger in, in any society as we you know, we've been finding out lately. Yes. Uh, yes. We, uh, two, all, all too palpably at points. Um, uh, I just had two more questions uh, and, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. So, so uh, uh, if you're watching and have a question for Sebastian, please, uh, please send it in. Um, kind of related uh, to, to how you just finished up there. You know, I, I think you do a great job of, of not being overt, overtly political in this book, right? You're, you're more interested in, in weaving together your journey and experience kind of with, you know, the history and, uh, uh, of this concept and, and, and this philosophical notion. But of course, freedom uh, in, uh, is, is, is going to be uh, a political idea, right? It's, 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 going, to be, it's going to be politicized. Um, and and uh, 2021 America is, is, is no exception to that. Uh, what, and maybe, maybe there's two answers to this. Maybe there's a, your optimistic answer to this and, and, and your, your pessimistic answer to this. What, what, it, what, what do you think the future of American freedom looks like? Well, okay. So we are, I think, almost guaranteed freedom in in the in the in the first sort of classic sense that a foreign power will not come in and kill and enslave us. I I don't think we're in danger of that. So, the so the question becomes: Can we maintain a fairly just and equitable society? Uh, can we keep leadership and and the sort of elite sector of society? from basically running a huge con game where everyone else is working 10 hours a day and most of the resources and most of the wealth and most of the power uh, is sort of like collecting up at the top 10% of society or, or, or whatever. Um, a lot of people have written about this sort of phenomenon of power and wealth sort of like collecting in a very, very small percentage of American society. And then eventually, you know, we have very just laws they're not always justly applied, but we have very just laws. Um, the democratic system uh, on paper is extremely fair and, um, you know, delivers victories pretty regularly, you know, pretty sort of half to the left, half to the right. You know, it's like throughout American history, it's sort of, you can tell it's fair because they're about half the presidents are Republicans and about half are Democrats or liberals and conservatives, whatever, you know, it works, you know, it works fairly well. And, uh, there's almost always a peaceful transfer of power. Um, so all that's great. But eventually, if there is enough economic injustice, um, if the, the game is just rigged to such an extent that elite people who are in one business can get favors from judges and politicians and elite be people in other businesses, and they all have the same lawyers, they work at the same law firms, and the whole thing is sort of rigged, like people aren't being deprived, you know, overtly deprived of their freedom, but they're definitely being used and duped. And I you know, I think American society and modern society is reaching a kind of critical point where people are real realizing, you know, hey, wait a minute, this is a rigged game. Like very, very few people are going to do well in this game. And they all went to elite colleges and they all know each other. And, you know, we're just, we're scratching on the door trying to get in. And that's, I think, most people. 
And I think where you get some of this incredible populist anger uh, um, on the mostly on the right, but also to some degree on the left, I think is like, you know, you know, I disagree with the specific politics of some of this stuff, but the impetus behind it, I think is, you know, I think there's something to really take a lesson from there. And um, if we don't fix that, we will not be a free country in some pretty important ways. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, some of the most powerful parts of, of the book, you know, you're, you're wandering through old, old still towns, old mill towns that have been completely left behind, but there's yeah. still people living there, or, you know, fellow, fellow citizens, yeah. uh, uh, you know, trying, trying, trying to get by. Um, so, uh, all right, last question from me. Uh, uh, so I'll stop jabbering and, and, and we can hear, hear, hear from the audience. Uh, what are you working on now, Sebastian? Uh, and and what, what can you share with us about it? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not working on anything at the moment, but I'm planning, the next book that I'm planning is about, um, it's going to be called Pulse. It's about why we're alive and what happens, what seems to happen when we die. Um, I almost died last summer from a very a sort of freak, a freak thing. I had a I didn't know. I had a congenital abnormality in my abdomen and it produced an aneurysm in my pancreatic artery, which is a really rare place to get an aneurysm. And it was asymptomatic and not related to any health issue, with, you know, not cholesterol or anything. It's purely structural. And out of the blue, with no warning at all, just like I'm talking to you right now, I suddenly felt this like pain shoot, shoot through my abdomen and I was bleeding out. And within a couple of minutes, I couldn't stand up. And within about 10 minutes, I started going blind. And um, my wife called the ambulance and it took them an hour and a half to get me to the ER. And um, by the time I got there, I was, I'd lost 90% of my blood, nine zero, 90% of my blood. And I was dying. I mean, I was on the way out. And I remember saying, the last thing I remember was saying to the doctor, he was, he was cutting my neck open to put a line into my neck they needed to put uh, 10 units of blood into me to save me. And he was working on my neck and I, and I felt this moment where suddenly I was like, Oh, here I go. And uh, I said, doc, you got to hurry. You're losing me right now. And right at, right at that moment, I mean, I should, I should say I'm an atheist. I'm sort of an anti mystic. I don't go to church. My dad was a physicist. I believe in things you can measure and, and theories that you can test, right? That's where I'm at intellectually. So I don't know what, I do not know how to explain what happened next. And that's what I want to write about. Um, this black pit opened up underneath me and I started getting pulled into it. And then my father appeared, my father's dead. My father appeared over me and he started trying to communicate with me and sort of comforting me. And, um, I was so, you know, whatever, my mind was so messed up that it didn't surprise me. But then when I woke up in the ICU the next day, I remembered like my dad, what was my dad doing there? I had no idea I was dying. I knew something very bad was happening. I didn't know I was dying and there he was. And so what I found out was that it's very, very common for dead ancestors to appear in the minds of people who are dying. And they can't reproduce that, you know, low oxygen level in the blood, ketamine, uh, 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 DMT, I think is the, the active ingredient in ayahuasca. Like there are all kinds of endogenous neurochemicals are released when people die and you can give those neurochemicals to people and they'll see some weird stuff, but they don't see their dead, their dead relatives. And that's a phenomenon that happens all over the world. And it just made me wonder, like, what is it we don't know? You know, I'm really, I'm really curious about it. I want to write a book that my father, the physicist would respect about what in God's name was he doing there when I didn't even know I was dying? Like, what is that about? And I'm, I'm really, um, I'm very, very curious about it. And two days earlier, I had a dream that I, terrifying dream that I was, that I died. You know, I had this warning dream. So just the whole way that that worked, you know, for a non-mystic, like I'm really at pains to like understand it. I want to try to understand it. Well, uh, first I know I'm speaking for everybody and uh, saying that, well, we're glad you made it through that. Um, and then second, uh, 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 not just that you made, made it through, but also that we, we get to read this, this book someday. So it's not, that, sound, that sounds really fascinating, Sebastian. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, we got some good questions lined up. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, did you have any tech with you on the journey, uh, even GPS? 
Uh, you know, the, the guys, I mean, I just have a flip phone. Um, the guys had, you know, what are now called normal phones, you know, smartphones. Um, but we had maps. I mean, I had, you know, like, ma like maps, like the kind that you <laughs> roll up and put in your backpack or in your back pocket. And uh, we had a compass and maps and I'm pretty good with both. And uh, so we really relied on that to know where we were. A lost start. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, uh, I'm glad to hear that those old old maps uh, are still getting some use out there in, in this brave new world yeah. we live in. Yeah. Uh, did the hike on the rails influence your patriotism at all? Uh, have you have you felt that wavering at all? And did the hike help reinvigorate your your love for this country? I mean, my patriotism is based on the the ideal of America and. Um, the reality of America isn't, you know, falls a little bit short of what the ideal is. And so my patriotism is not going anywhere because I still believe in that ideal. I just think the reality of America needs some work. Like we all need some work. Like, I mean, who I am is not the ideal of who I want to be either. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, you know, no, my patriotism go, didn't go anywhere. And, and, and my, my patriotism consists of a profound belief in human dignity and freedom and democracy. And those things are not in any way um, limited to or specific to the United States. I mean, there are many countries that embody those ideals, and we're one of them. We're an amazing example. We're an early example, and I'm very proud to be an American. But you know, we're not the only we're not the only show in town. A lot of other countries and societies have have um, ex have produced all of the, those those three ideals like beautifully, and. Um, so that's really what my allegiance is to, is to those ide ideals. These two questions are, are kind of related, so I'll just ask them together. Um, do you think that we are at a, polit a political transition point now? And where is our political system going? Uh, and uh, what, did you, what, what from your travels did you, did you, did you find any answers for that on your travels? Uh, I don't know if we're in a transition, but the, the Republican Party is definitely in a transition. And, you know, if they don't do this, this transition successfully, um, and if they don't make um, the truth, uh, their highest, highest value. And the democratic system, um, something um, that they believe in to the point of almost worshiping it. If they don't do that um, by themselves, they can bring down this democracy. Um, the political system doesn't have to collapse for that to happen. All you need is one party. Um, Spain was a democracy. Uh, in 1936, a progressive government was voted in. Um, and you know, it was, it was after the great um, it was after the Great Depression, and there were a lot of um, you know, there were a lot of initiatives in, in the world to, uh, to, to distribute, redistribute wealth a little bit and social welfare and all the, you know, all these sort of like ideas that are now completely normal, but they were coming in in the 1930s in reaction to the Great Depression that was all, you know, happened all over the world. And so progressives came in with these ideas and the fascists in Spain under Franco um, declared that the election had been stolen. Uh, that it was not a fair election, that it had been stolen, that it was all fraud, and that Spain would never, ever have freely elected uh, uh, people with progressive ideals. And, and the fact that they did is proof that it was stolen. And so they, they started a civil war. And, and the fascists won. And they murdered something like 200,000 people for their political beliefs. They put them against walls and machine gunned them. Right, that's what fascism is. It's also what what communism can be, and anarch, anarchism, and all that. I mean, they're not the only bad people in the world, but in in, in the case of Spain, it was the fascists. And um, so, when you start lying, when you and we start lying to justify taking power, it's a very very quick route to civil war. It doesn't take long. It takes maybe a few weeks, you know. And so the GOP has to decide. I think, do, do they want to maintain this lie that the election was stolen or do they want to live in a democracy and, and uh, return to power, return to office, return to influence uh, because they are just have figured out how to be more appealing 
to a majority of Americans. I don't know where it's going to head. It could, I, frankly, I think it could go either way. Yeah, they they had a vote. They had a vote earlier today on this. So uh, early, early, early warning sign, perhaps. What, what I, you know, what I'll say is that under this this approach that they seem to have developed, um, that you know that they have lost in two two short years, they lost the House, the Senate, and the White House. Right. My fear is that even with all the changes to election laws and all that stuff, if they lose ground again in 2022, uh, if they fail to take the White House in 2024, that they will basically just say, you know what, the hell with it. This, the, 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 we're, we're never going to get back to power through the vote. So we don't believe in democracy anymore. I mean, that, that's my worry that they actually, if they, you know, as a Democrat, I hope they don't win because I think their ideals are suspect right now. But in some ways I sort of like hope they win a little bit so that they actually maintain some faith in the democratic system. So they, they maintain a stake in the democratic system because if they just decide that they cannot win office democratically, what's to stop the worst of them? Uh, and by worst, I mean the most violent and undemocratic of them. Um, just saying, all right, we'll do it. We'll do it the Spanish way, you know. And then it'll be some decades before we re re regain our democracy and our dignity. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, as bad as January January six was, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think of something much worse. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in tribe, you uh, also juxtapo juxtapose tribal and colonial life, uh, and you describe tribal life as more free and appealing to some. As it provided less safety for many, how does that compare with your view, your views expressed in freedom? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, actually, I'm not sure tribal life provided less safety for its, the inhabitants. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, I mean, the illness in Western society was um, a huge, huge threat to human life, right? And, and the the native peoples of America until they were exposed exposed to European illnesses like smallpox, actually you know they 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 were healthier they were taller they were stronger, um they like they, it, just as sort of physical specimens they 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 were doing way better than the sort of anemic Europeans, um I mean the, I mean seriously as, as just a matter of general health the, the natives were actually way better off, um and you know keep in mind Europe. You know, they had the, you know, they weren't that, you know, it was only a couple hundred years since the Black Death um, of the plague that killed one third of Europe, right? One out of three people were killed in the Black Death. The nat natives of North America had, had no issues like that until the Europeans showed up. So, um, and they were amazing fighters, right? I mean, I like, so I, you know, I, I actually, I wouldn't, the, the premise of the question I think isn't quite accurate. Um, another tri tribe related question uh, in tribe, you speak to the value of, a, of tribal ceremonies that help returning warriors to process the trauma and reintegrate back into uh, their society. Uh, for you, O'Byrne and, and some of the others, do you think this was, was somewhat similar of an experience? Oh yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there's, I mean, yeah, it's a little different because the cathartic experience comes from performing in front of your people, like performing, recounting, singing, telling, dancing, whatever it may be, like what you experience and the catharsis comes from doing it in public and um, sort of communicating that psychic load to the community that you live in. What we were doing was not public. I mean, it was just the four of us. And sometimes it was just three of us. And a couple of times it was just two of us. You know, we did it off and on over the course of a, of a year or two. Um, uh, so it was a much more personal and kind of private thing within this small group. But I got to say that the, the, the dynamic in that group and the environment we were moving through just in its um, potential danger, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, someone started shooting at us, for example. Um, but the trains were dangerous. I mean, the whole thing, you know, whatever was hard and dangerous. All of those things made it feel, uh, I don't mean this ironically, made it feel nicely like war. You know, it was like familiar... It was very familiar to us because it felt like war. And there was something about that that absolutely felt good to us. Um, and um, and there's something, you know, not that we were out there as a form of therapy, but there is something very therapeutic about exhaustion. 
It's about physical activity. Um, just grinding yourself down physically until your mind is like, you know what, whatever I'm worried about back home, I'm not worried anymore. I just want to sit down and have a cigarette and go to sleep. You know, like there is something to be said for that. Sure. sure. Uh, this will be our last question since we're, we're pressed, pressed up against the time here. Um, was there anything else that you felt was important that you, you just couldn't get into the book uh, on a different subject maybe that came to you came to you when, when you were walking the lines uh, and your mind was no longer kind of consciously thinking, uh, kind, kind of like that process you just described? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, look, there's a lot of things that are interesting. And, uh, you know, if I'd written a book that was just filled with interesting things, it'd be 500 pages, you know. Um, the book is, an, is not a, um, it's not about an event. It's not a doc, it's not documenting something. It's, um, it's about an idea. It's about a concept. And as was Tribe, the rest of my books were about something that happened that I was trying to chronicle. And for ideas, I feel like for concepts, if you're, you're going to write a whole book about a concept like freedom, um, the shorter, the better. I mean, the, the, if you use the fewest amount of words, the most artfully assembled to communicate the, the, essential, um, the essential message of this, of this idea, uh, and it, then if you do it as, as, as incisively as possible, the maximum number of people will read the whole thing and absorb it. And you don't, you know, give a man a fish, he eats once, give a man, teach a man how to fish, he eats the rest of his life. It's sort of the same thing. Like I, I, what I want to do is write a short, concise book that communicated this concept. And then you, the reader, can take it on and realize looking around and experiencing your life and looking around in the world, oh yeah, that's that, that's kind of the start of the same thing that Sebastian Younger was writing about. Like you can assemble your own fascinating thousand page volume of, rela of related ideas um, on your own. But what I want to do is, is, is provide the idea so that then those things crystallize in your mind um, or not, but you know, ho I'm hoping they will because I think what I was writing is correct and illuminating of our experience as, as human beings. A absolutely. Uh, and I think that's what's so, so uh, smart about the structure and the layering uh, that we, you know, kind of move in and out of your experiences into kind of a, a wider trajectory uh, that, you know, uh, focused on, on big human history, American history, uh, 20, you know, the 20 cent, the, the, uh, the way the word freedom has kind of changed yeah. uh, uh, over the years and, and, and our interpretations of it. Um, congratulations again, Sebastian. It's just a really superb book uh, and uh, really, really enjoyed talking with you this evening. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody out there. Uh, it was a real pleasure being part of this. Yeah, and I just want to thank you both on behalf of Town Hall. Um, this has been a really fascinating conversation to listen to, and the book sounds really interesting. Um, so thank you so much for sharing it with us. I want to encourage anyone who's watching to purchase the book through the link in the chat. That's going to take you right over to Third Place Books. You can support a local local store. I want to thank you for watching tonight. Thank you for all your great questions. Um, and you know, next time we host both of you, it'd be great to see you in person uh, in our building. But I guess until then, um, I hope that you stay safe and have a great night. Thank you.